Now we look at the ISO 9001 2025 committee draft, which has been leaked. Okay, hello everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the ISO 9001 2025 Committee Draft, or CD. This is a version of the standard that doesn't get released to the public. I don't know if it'll be leaked. It was leaked to me by a few people. Uh, if ISO thinks they know who did it, they probably don't. They would be surprised. Um, but um, Or maybe they wouldn't be. Um, but it's, it's already leaking uh, down to you know some, some low-level people who probably shouldn't have it. So, I mean, it's not just me. But anyway, it's probably not going to get published. But uh, as you'll see, uh, there's probably no reason for you to even get it. Um, but let's take a look at it. Let's jump into it and see what it's talking about and what does it predict for the future of, the, of this standard. So yeah, here it is. This is the um, this is a, what the document looks like. It's a Word document. Came over. It's uh, over 80 pages long. Um, that's not too frightening in and of itself. The last committee draft of uh, the, the 2015 standard was also that many pages when it was put in Word. That doesn't mean that's going to be how many pages it is uh, when it's converted to a PDF and there's a uh, there's some other stuff in there that's not going to get carried over. <clears throat> um, we'll talk about that in a minute, though. There's an appendix that's absolutely massive, may or may not show up in the final version. Um, but yeah, so uh, right now it's a it's a Word document. It's got numbering, uh, line numbering on the left there. Um, the uh, I, I believe that the, the rule is that they're not going to publish this. It's not supposed to be published. Until I hear otherwise, I'm not going to publish it because, uh, you know, their, ice, their, their lawyers will be all over me, so... We'll leave it alone for now, but let's look at it. It's it's probably not worth getting anyway, to be honest with you. As you're going to see, probably not worth you know your time and effort to even try, try bothering. I'm going to tell you everything that's here, and, and you're going to be unimpressed. I think uh, when this is when this is over, um, where are we at now? This is the CD. This is called the committee draft, and these are all the various steps uh, that are required for an ISO standard uh, to become a final published document. So we're at the CD stage now. That's the committee draft. What happened prior to that was usually there's a WD, a working draft, which is pretty rough. They actually kind of skipped that. They had a secret draft that was basically just they took an update from Annex SL. They laid that in. Um, that was essentially it. I mean, just, just some people riffing in, in Microsoft Word. Um, that was never released. I've never even seen it. Uh, who knows? Maybe it doesn't even exist. Now, the committee draft is the first official stage. Um, a lot can change from here to the final, um, but I, I don't think a lot is going to change. Uh, I don't think so in this time. They're really pushing hard and fast to get this done. So we're at the CD stage. What's going to happen next is we're going to have a draft international standard, a DIS. At that point, we're pretty much going to know what the standard will look like uh, when it's published. Um, they have the option to do a DIS-2, DIS-2, Draft International Standard. Second one, they're not going to do that. They're not. They never do, but it, it's an option if they want it. Then you have your FDIS. That's the one now that's uh, released for um, final voting. So the only changes they're allowed to make from the DIS to the FDIS is grammar and punctuation formatting, you know, fixing typographical errors. Of course, they don't do that. Sometime, last time they added actual requirements <laughs> in the, at that stage because uh, they broke the rules. Hopefully they won't do that this time. Um, once the world votes on the FDIS, it then becomes the final standard, which is the international standard. That's the one that's now act would be then active and uh, replaces uh, the, the 2015 version. But right now we're at the CD, the committee draft, early days yet. But again, I don't suspect that we're going to see much changes from the CD to all the way to the end. I would expect they may even skip the DIS step entirely. I, I don't know. Maybe they'll just go to FDIS. I don't know. We'll see. So what do we have in the way of new requirements specifically? Because that's what you're worried about, right? Um, what are the new requirements, things that you're going to have to implement? Well, the short version is that there's nearly none. You're reading that right. Um, right now, as it as it stands now with the committee draft, the, the, uh, the ISO 9001-2025 standard will be considered a minor revision, not a major. Now, this keeps, in, this keeps tracking with ISO's previously undocumented pattern of doing a major revision only every other change. Uh, we thought this was going to be a fairly significant change based on feedback coming from the consultants on the committee. Seems like that so far has not turned into anything. There are almost no new requirements. I'm going to go over what they are. Um, but that can change. Uh, 
if that changes, it will mean that the private consultants on TC-176 have gotten in and they've tinkered, they've tinkered, tinkered. But so far, <clears throat> they've not done that, which is um, uh, fairly amazing, with one gigantic exception we'll get to at the end. Clause 4, all they did here under context of the organization or CODO was they added the climate change language, which we've already seen in the in the amendment they released uh, a little while ago. So if you've implemented the amendment, there are no changes to Clause 4.0 at all, right? And again, the climate change stuff is really addressed, you know, you almost don't have to do anything. Um, it's just theatrics and, and showboating, so not a lot there. Clause 5. Um, here they made a couple minor changes, or one minor change. Under uh, leadership, um, they've added some things that um, require now top management to prove um, they're showing um, a, you know, a culture of ethics and integrity and a quality culture. The problem with Clause 5.1, if you've, if you've you know, been to any of my training or read my book, is I say that that, that is you know, really a list of uh, wishful things, but it's entirely unauditable and unenforceable. Um, there's not a lot that anybody can do about it. Uh, auditors, what they do is they go in there, they sit with the boss, they talk for five minutes, and they leave, and they check the box. Nobody ever gets any nonconformities under Clause 5.1. So them adding anything to that clause is, is just meaningless. It's just theatrics again. So in a practical sense, Clause 5 has no new requirements. In a literal sense, it does, but they're not, they're not auditable or enforceable. Clause 6 makes a bizarre change, absolutely mind-bogglingly bizarre in that they go backwards. It now says that quality objectives only have to be measurable when practicable. Every edition of the standard that's ever mentioned quality objectives said that they needed to be measurable, obviously, because they didn't want to have slogans, right? They didn't want quality objectives to be slogans. The consultants got in there and tinkered with this one for no damn reason, and now say that your quality objectives don't even need to be measurable. So in other words, you can go back to using slogans if you can show that, well, it wasn't practicable for me to for me to measure it, which is, you know, a kind of subjective thing. I don't get that because that's not, they're not actually adding a requirement. They're like eliminating a requirement. So if you were Deming, you were already upset at ISO for instituting management by objective. Now they're just moving further over into management by slogans, you know. I don't understand it. Bizarre. Has no practical effect on you. you. You won't have to make any changes to your system, so who cares? Uh, another thing that they did, this is not a requirement now, but they restructured the clause on risk and opportunity into sub-clauses. Um, and they actually did a fairly good job here uh, with, with the usual caveats um, in that they don't they want people to understand that risks and opportunity are different. So that's a good thing because the, the current standard d doesn't really distinguish between the two. But there's still some huge flaws in that opportunity still is not defined anywhere. They go into all these definitions of risk, but nobody tells you what an opportunity is. And the other thing is that this clause still doesn't require anything. It's still risk-based thinking. It's absolutely empty. It's vapid. But you know, again, this will not change your requirements. It's just a presented in a different way that might make you understand it better. But again, no new requirement there. Clause 7, no new requirements at all under, under 7. Um, they did, oh, here's where they begin a pattern of adding these, what I call cringe notes. They're cringeworthy, absolutely ugh, shudder inducing, bad insult, you know, consultant stuff. So under infrastructure, they added a note where they're just trying to to make themselves sound smart okay so for example it says um they're gonna under infrastructure now you're gonna talk about ai the metaverse vr and chatbots <laughs> okay man <laughs> we get it you got to understand the people on these committees on tc176 one are really old but not only it's not even an ageism thing because even the people who are younger and by younger i mean in their 50s and 60s you know um they're technologically backwards. You know, some of them are still using AOL email addresses, right? Um, if you've ever been to one of their, their presentations, you know, they struggle to start up their computer and get PowerPoint to work right. They present their PowerPoint slides not in a, a, a slideshow format, but as if they were, you know, it's still minimized and you can't read it. They don't know how to use, like, the clicker to advance their slides. They're technologically, uh, you know, ignorant. 
And so this is just them doing something uh, where they try to sound sound cool. And let me just let me pause there for a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna break and come back, but I want I want to show you something. Yeah. So so th just take a look at a second for this article which came out in Quality Digest just a little while ago. Um, <clears throat> this is written by Denise Robitaille. Yeah, it came from uh, last month, so uh, March of 2024 about how ISO 9001 is being revised. Essentially what this was is that uh, Denise has been on the, the committee, the US tag to TC-176 for about a thousand years. Um, I'm not sure, if that, that that number may not be accurate. It might be more like 998 or something like that, but approximately that. Um, she's written a lot of books about it. And uh, I'll just say the, uh, you know, and I've met her, um, nothing significant. I think we shared an elevator once, I said hello to her or something, but I've been in a couple meetings where she was. Um, and she's just a blindingly stupid person. I'll just say it. I mean, I, it's just astonishing to me that um, she gets up in the morning and, and doesn't uh, strangle herself when she ties her shoes. Where's where is it? There's a there's a quote here. Um, oh yeah, look at this again. This is somebody. I don't know if she uses an AOL address or something like that, but she's one of those those types. Let's look over here. The risk of ISO nine thousand one becoming a stagnant document became apparent. Things had changed around the world. To highlight just a few, digitized processes, AI, climate change, ESG initiatives, virtual companies with no geographic ad address, cryptocurrency, and all the smaller innovations invention and inventions in markets and sectors. So what she's trying to do, she's trying to make an argument that ISO 9001 needed desperately to be updated against the votes of the world to, to address these things. Digitized processes. AI, climate change, all this stuff, right? All right. So two things. One, no, none of those things really have an effect on a quality management system standard because a QMS standard never talks about tools. It just talks about methods, right? So we don't care about AI. We don't care about if you use AI for document control or if you use, you know, an old style binder with a rubber stamp. You just have to control your documents. The standard has never told you how to do it and still doesn't, right? So we don't care about digitized process and AI. We don't care about cryptocurrency, for God's sake, no. That has no effect on quality management, right? But that's what she was saying here. And then, wh where is it here? Um, yeah, he here it is. It's right at the top, okay? It, I, I, that's why I couldn't find it. To retain relevance, ISO 9001 must continue to accommodate evolving realities. Now, I'm not sure what reality Denise is in, all right? But okay. All right, let's say we believe you. Let's say that... Reality has changed dramatically in just 10 years, in nine years, since 2015, that something's happened. Now, we know what the big one is, is AI is a big one. But again, AI is a tool, and the standard never talks about tools, so it's irrelevant, but okay. She says, has to accommodate evolving realities. So let's now jump back, keep that in mind, and let's jump back to the review of the, uh, the actual standard. So again, just remember that Denise, representing TC-176, said that this standard had to be updated because we want to address evolving realities. Is that what she said? Accommodate uh, evolving realities, right? So what did they do? I mean, she wrote an entire article in Quality Digest about this. What does that mean? What did they do to the standard to address evolving realities? This is what they did. They added this kind of silly nonsense here where they put it, in a, in a in parentheses so it's 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 just an example so it's just an example it's not a requirement they think that by dropping in terms like ai metaverse which is already dead vr and chatbots okay that you know that that now they've evolved that they forced an entire uh update to the standard in violation of the world's votes to add a note in parentheses that name drops these terms like AI, metaverse, VR, and chatbots. That's what they did. They don't have actual requirements about using AI because they can't, because like I said, it's a tool. They don't talk about the metaverse because they can't because it's already dead, right? The metaverse never happened. You don't see anything about cryptocurrency in here, obviously. So I don't know what Denise was smoking the day she wrote that article because it's not in here. Astonishing though, absolutely astonishing. And it gets worse. So hold on to that, that idea of cringe notes because there are gonna be more of those. The good news is it doesn't affect the requirements. Let's move. Clause 8. This is astonishing. Clause 8, they spent no time on. You can tell that um, for this committee draft, they did nothing on Clause 8. Nothing. 
Now, it tells us a couple things. One is that Clause 8 is where the shop floor stuff happens, right? I don't think anybody working on TC-176 has been on a shop floor. And if they have, it's probably been about 30 years since they, they were. It's been a very long time since they've operated a shop. They don't know anything about it, right? Um, and so they, they just they skip this part. And Clause 8 is the bulk of the standard. It's where most of the requirements are. And they added nothing. So I don't know if that will be one where we do see uh, some updates um, to that, you know, when we go from CD to DIS version, I don't know, maybe they're going to touch on that. If they don't, it's weird because there's, there's a lot of places in there that need to get fixed. Um, let's go. Uh, oh, here's another one. A21 adds a cringe note about customer communication where, again, I guess to accommodate these evolving realities, we're going to just name drop these things like these words like website content and frequently asked questions. It's as if they just they just logged off of America Online or Sears Prodigy and they said, hey, there's a new term called an FAQ. Let's put that in the standard. Oh, my God. It's just so cringy, cringy, cringy. Clause 9, performance evaluation. Again, no new requirements. Weird. Um, clause, um, oh, they did just change the title of 9.2. It now, it's now called Internal Auditing Program. So if you're slavish about making sure that your documents refer to the correct title, you'll have to go in and change your documents because the clause name changed, but there's no new requirements there. Um, clause 10, no new requirements under the improvement clause. However, again, we see 10.1 uh, adding yet another cringe note here where they give examples of improvement and now they're just name dropping these words like incremental and breakthrough change, innovation and reorganization. But again, it's in a note. So dude, we don't care... It, but your 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 bullshit consulting terms, if you throw them in a note, you know, if you put them in a requirement, that's what we care about. All of this stuff is just attempts to try to make you seem young and hip and cool. It's not working, dude. And there, oh, yeah, and then you see emerging technology. All right, whatever. So the summary is that the only changes in the standard right now, okay, they added climate change, which you probably already did. You know about that already. So if, if, you would, if you've implemented a climate change language, you don't need to do anything. Ethics and integrity and quality of uh, culture of quality, they're two things that, you, you know, <clears throat> again, if you're slavish to making sure that your language and your manual matches the standard, then you're going to have to add those words, but it's unenforceable. It's, un you know, it, it doesn't, they don't have a clause that says you will have a culture of quality and this is what it means and this is what it has to include and this is what you got to document. None of that. It's just feel good stuff. So again, not, it's, it's a new requirement, but there's nothing that you have to do. Quality objectives no longer need to be measurable, so they're actually removing a requirement. Okay, don't listen to them. And then auditing title was named, the, the auditing clause was renamed. So you could see there's, there's like nothing here, nothing. You almost, you almost don't need to do anything. And if, if you're just one of those people that really has to match the wording, you're going to have to go in and change some words. But you don't do that. That's dumb. Here's what they didn't fix. In Clause 4, context of the organization is, God damn it, still out of order. It's in the wrong order. you got to identify your stakeholders first, then their concerns and, and, and requirements. Okay? And they got them backwards. Not only that, it's supposed to build up to something. It's supposed to build up to actually defining the context. And you know what that is? That's the scope statement. So you're supposed to do 4.2 first, identify your stakeholders, 4.1 next, understand what they care about, their issues and requirements, then go to 4.4 processes, understand that, and it builds up to 4.3, your scope statement, which guess what defines the context of the organization. So these clowns still don't know what that clause is even about because they copied and pasted it from Annex SL and, and they, they didn't do anything. Clause 5.1, leadership still just as unauditable as ever, and it's also just a list of grievances. 5.1, the leadership thing is, you know, just a list of grievances. They're all, all these consultants used to be a quality manager or something or whatever a hundred years ago. And it's all the things that they were upset about. You know, they say, uh, you know, management didn't give me resources. So now I'm going to put it in the ISO standard and they're going to have to give me resources. And that's all it is. It's just a list of grievances. In clause six, they're still pretending that risk-based thinking, one, that it exists, it doesn't, it's fake. Okay. And two, that it actually works. And now we're coming on 10 years of experience. There's no evidence that risk-based thinking has had any effect whatsoever because it's fake. It's vaporware. And they're digging their heels in. They're going to just keep pretending that this is a thing. Uh, so that's a problem. They still did not fix that. Clause 7 still includes all these off-topic concepts under the work environment clause, like socially 
uh, no, no, what is it? Uh, uh, emotionally protective workplace, that kind of stuff. It's still in there. They're, they didn't fix that. Um, which is huge because, again, as I've said over and over, that gets people sued. You know, your, your internal auditors are not qualified to be auditing whether or not you have an emotionally protective workplace. You know, they're not legally trained to be able to say in an audit report whether or not there's discrimination going on. All right. That, so it's just dangerous stuff. Um, and they stuck in. They're still sticking with documented information. They've decided they're not going to try to clarify, um, go back to the old way where we had control of documents, control of records separate. It's still all jumbled up and merged into a single confusing mess called documented information. Clause 8.1 still makes a silent distinction between organizational versus operational processes. Yeah, so what happens is when you get to 8.1, um, it starts talking about... Uh, uh, operational processes, and they didn't bother to tell you up in 4.4 that, oh yeah, there's going to be a thing we talk about later called operational processes, and that's different from organizational processes, uh, and they never they never say that. So you come to 8.1, it makes no sense because they don't provide any context. And then 8.1 still demotes outsourced processes. Outsourced processes should have been elevated to its own requirement. It still just points to purchasing clause, and I'm telling you, the control of outsourced processes is much more uh, complicated than just saying, oh, purchasing takes care of it. All right. Um, it needs its own clause. <clears throat> A2 still treats the requirements review as occurring before a customer even comes into the picture. A2, which used to, we used to call contract review in the old days, in the 2015, they did a bizarre thing where they say you're supposed to do all of this requirements review um, before you offer the product to the customer. It says, you know, uh, requirements of, of products to be offered to the customer, like it's a future state. There's no customer yet. And in reality, that's not how anybody does it. But we all just ignore that. We ignore those words to be offered and we pretend like it's normal and it's not. And they didn't, they didn't fix that. A3, design still as confusing as ever. You're not going to be able to understand a damn thing in clause 8.3. And you know what? They changed the title a while ago saying it's design of products and services and, the, and the, they still don't have anything about service design. Nothing. So except mentioning it in the title, it's still about designing widgets. You know, 8.4, they didn't fix the confusing bullet list mistake. So again, they made a mistake in, I think it's 843, where it says you've got to communicate to your suppliers the following, right? And they forgot to put the words as applicable, which was in the older version of the standard. And they forgot that. This standard still does not fix that. We've written to them multiple times. There's an official interpretation. So it tells me that the TC-176 people did not go back and read the official interpretations of TC-176. And they're just... They're ignoring them, and so they're not fixing the things that people wrote wrote requests for interpretation about. And this was one of them, so that mistake is still there. Um, still no requirement for a record of purchases, so you don't need a PO. So all those auditors out there, you know, writing nonconformities against your purchase orders, there's no requirement to have a purchase order in the first place. They didn't put it in there. They didn't fix that. So you can literally get on the phone and order an airplane or a bunch of parts to make an airplane verbally and say, hey, Joe, give me those 10 things, hang up, and you've complied with the standard. And again, this just shows how the authors are so divorced from how like a simple thing like placing an order with a supplier, how that works. They don't know. And so they just they just write this nonsensical stuff. 8.5, hey, there's still no delivery clause. You just make product, you inspect it, and it disappears. We don't know what happens to it. You don't ever ship it. There's still no shipping and delivery clause. They're so stupid. Um, and then the post-delivery thing clause on post-delivery activities is still just really weird, bizarre, confusing. Um, 8.6 still abandons the term measurement, uh, monitoring and measurement for planned arrangements. Yeah, so what happens in the standard now is it, 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 just astonishing. From clause 4 all the way up to clause 8.5, monitoring and measurement is understood to mean inspection and testing. They talk about using devices for monitoring and measuring, and, and it's understood. It means inspection and testing. That's the way they define it. They don't use the word inspection, but that's how they define it. Now in 8.6, suddenly they use the term planned arrangements to mean inspection and testing, and you're supposed to know that. You're supposed to just know that. Um, <clears throat> they still refuse to use the word inspection because they don't want you to think it's an inspection-based standard. When it is, they're just using different words to mean it. And so 8.6 is still very, very confusing. 8.7, still confusing. Yeah, it's just a mess. Absolute mess on control of non conforming product. I don't know what, why they, again, you know, the, the 2000 version was perfectly fine. They didn't need to go in there and change things. Uh, and they did um, for no reason. So that's a mess. Nine, 
Yeah, nine. I've written a video on this. Go see the other video. I think I call it ISO 9001's biggest fail. Um, they break the Plan Do Check Act, PDCA, and the process approach entirely because they forget about them. They tell you all in the front matter that this is going to be all about PDCA, and then they structure the standard in a way that follows Plan Do Check Act. And then they go into a big thing about the process approach way up top in 4.4, and they forget about them. Now you come to 9, and they don't tell you to go back and, and measure your processes to determine the effectiveness of the quality management system. Um, and so there's never a loop back to the, the check and the act part. So they have you checking stuff, but not checking what they told you to do early up in the front of the standards. Just ridiculous. And the, the, internet, the internal auditing clause still doesn't talk about process-based auditing. It's probably a good thing because the clowns that are writing this don't really know what process-based auditing is, even though they claim to write books about it. They don't understand it, um, and nobody does. So it would have been nice maybe if ISO 9001 added some language here, but I'm sure they would have screwed it up. So maybe we dodged a bullet on that. But if you're looking for help on process-based auditing, you're not going to find it here. Um, clause 10, yeah, again, repeats the thing. Now we're in 10, which is improvement. You're supposed to be wrapping around the PDCA model to the stuff you talked about in the front of the standard, and they never do that. It just it just stops, right? Um, 10.1 and 10.3 are still redundant with each other. Uh, it's just bizarre. Um, I, don't, I don't know why they, they seem to think that these clauses, they use entirely different words, but when you analyze them, they're kind of saying the same thing. And you know what? They still don't have a preventive action clause. Uh, TC-176 is so egotistical, they're not going to admit their mistake. They're digging in. They're still saying risk-based thinking is preventive action. They could go back and fix this. It's, it's, this is the gravest error in ISO 9001 now. The most deadliest error because without a preventive action system, you no longer need to be proactive about about problems. Um, and it even says that we now react to nonconformities. We don't you know, proactively go after them. And, and that means that you can let airplanes fall out of the sky and then react to them afterwards instead of taking preventive action on your your organ your operational processes uh, to fix them. Now, they say that risk-based thinking replaces preventive action, but risk-based thinking up in Clause 6 is clearly talking about risks related to the high-level organization, not about product down in, the, in Clause 8 or anything like that. You can interpret it that way, but you're, you're going beyond what the standard says. And, of course, Clause um, 6 doesn't require any records, any procedure, any root cause analysis, uh, no documentation, nothing. You don't have to do anything for risk-based thinking. So if they're replacing preventive action with risk-based thinking, they're, they're replacing it with nothing. You're, you don't have to do anything. And they should have fixed that, and they just won't because they're dumb, dumb, dumb. They're dumb and arrogant, which is a bad mix. The one huge change to the standard is the addition of a 30-page addition. Now, 30 pages in the Word format. We don't know what that would appear in the, in the PDF. But it is a massive monster appendix called Gu Appendix A, Guidance on the Use of the Internet of this International Standard. Um, it is astonishing. I'm going to probably have more material on this, though. It's it's a mixed bag, right? What, for one, it basically takes the other standard, one of the TS, TS 9002, I forget it is, whatever it is, but it, it tells you how to implement ISO 9001. And they, they put it in ISO 9001 now, right? It is a consultant's guide to implementing the standard. So there's good and bad about this. The good thing is if they keep this in there, you're not going to need to buy any of the books from these clowns who wrote the standard. They're cannibalizing their own, their own business model, right? Which is weird. How did they allow that to happen? And the second thing is that that's the good thing. And I'll come back to that. The bad thing is that some of the advice in there is not good, and it's still written by people who kind of don't understand. They haven't been on a shop floor in many, many years, right? Decades of, or more, and they're given this high-minded advice, you know, and, and you could tell it was probably written in a, in, a, in a Starbucks somewhere, you know, where they're drinking coffee, listening to smooth jazz, and, you know, not, you know, you know there's no machine banging away in the background. They're not getting their hands dirty. Um, so maybe it's bad, but let's go back to that good side. Now, what we've seen is that I'm getting reports from multiple people, not directly, but people they've spoken to, where some of these famous consultants who've been working on this are pissed off about this standard. They don't say why. This could be the reason why. This is undercutting their ability to sell a book later, right, to justify this. 
Now, what it means is ISO is grabbing that market. They're going to put the book inside ISO 9001. It's going to double the price of the standard, at least, because the page count's going to now be huge, right? It's going to go from whatever it is, 30, 40 pages, to at least 80 pages now, I think, right? So it's going to be huge if they leave it in here. So ISO is making that money now, and that has infuriated some of the consultants, these famous consultants on there. It could also be why Lori Hunt resigned. Now, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just I don't know. We don't know why Lori Hunt resigned. Could be health. She was having health problems. Could be health related. She says it was, you know, effectively to spend more time with her family or whatever. Um, that, she didn't say that, but it sounded like that. But is it that she's been addicted to writing books and holding the ISO conference, uh, international conference every year? And, you know, that's how she makes her money. And now ISO just took that away from her. I don't know. She may have written this appendix. So maybe this is her work. She, she may have done this and feel like uh, this is her, her master work. And now she left. That could be also a thing. But I don't know who wrote this. Um, it doesn't read like a Lori Hunt thing, that's for sure. It reads a little bit like a Nigel Croft thing, but some of it, a little bit of it are little points that, that aren't. The thing is, it was definitely written by one person. So one person has added text to an appendix without consensus, without subject matter experts. There's no way a group of people wrote this. And now what they're going to do is they're just going to vote on it. Um, some of the information in there is good, and the fact that it's there is good, but some of the information is bad and, and also a little cringy. So I don't know about that. And, you know, is that worth it, what the massive expense that you're going to see? Uh, the increase in price, I'm not sure. And then the other thing is maybe it's included right now just for the author's reference while they're working on the CD, and they're going to turn that into the DIS. Are they going to take Appendix A out? Is that possible? I don't think so, because they have an Appendix B. So then if they took out Appendix A, that would make Appendix B the new A, right? And what would Appendix A be? So it doesn't seem that would be the case. So very strange, uh, really, really strange. Um, I'm not sure what people are going to think of that. Um, there's some stuff in there. Again, maybe it's good, but, but it, maybe it's going to come out. Maybe it's going to be taken out. So, so there you have it. I mean, the, the, the new standard, the, as, as far as the committee draft goes, doesn't add any real new requirements that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to go in and change some wording in your manual if you're one of those people who wants everything to line up perfectly, I guess. But right now, uh, that, that's the situation. I, I think the bigger problem is that it doesn't fix any of the major flaws in ISO 9001-2015, like the lack of a preventive action clause, the fact that clause 4 is all in the wrong order. Uh, the confusing language that they add all over the place. The design clause is still a disaster. So um, they didn't fix any of that stuff, which is really the opportunity they had here, and they're not taking it because they're just, you know, the authors are just dug in that they know better than everybody. Uh, and if you tell them that their standard is 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 doesn't make any sense, they're going to say, well, that's, you're an idiot. And then, of course, the other big change is this, this addition of this appendix, a uh, massive thing. If, if that stays in there, I, I don't, it's going to be, it's going to be a big impact on folks who write books um, I don't care. I don't really want to write a. I'm, I'm not looking forward to writing an update to my surviving ISO 9001 book, which it may or may not be called that. Um, so I don't. I don't really care. But I mean, all those those folks, uh, you know, on, on the committee who who rely on those books to to you know make money, you're not going to need to buy one. You just buy the standard. ISO is going to cannibalize all of that business. They're taking that money for themselves now. So, just really strange. So that's it. Uh, so you know. Uh, Again, the, the CD won't be published, but make sure you, you know, subscribe to the Oxbridge website so you can make sure that you understand what's happening and all the news that's coming out and any updates that there might be when they eventually publish the DIS version. So thanks.